There is a well-known cliché in alternate history that goes, nothing ever happens in South America. This is a reference to a lack of alternate history set there, especially by creators outside the continent. Indeed, even when works of alternate history have a global scope, South America tends to only get a passing mention. However, in a lukewarm defense of our favorite genre, I would say that this cliché applies to other genres as well, regardless of the medium. But occasionally, for better or worse, something does happen in South America, and we're going to talk about one such incident. Hello everyone, I'm Matt Mitrovich, the Alternate Historian. In this video, we're going to talk about the Federation of the Americas from Call of Duty Ghosts and whether or not it's plausible. For those who don't know, Call of Duty Ghosts is a 2013 first-person shooter developed by Infinity Ward and published by Activision. It's set in the near, now obsolete, future where the United States is at war with the Federation of the Americas. Now, to be frank, the game provides few details on the history of the Federation. I watched the playthrough of the game done by MK Ice and Fire on YouTube and read through articles on the Call of Duty wiki, but even after all of that, there are still a lot of gaps in the Ghosts timeline. But here's what we do know. After a 2015 war in the Middle East, most of the major oil producers in the region are destroyed. The resulting energy crisis causes most of South and Central America to unite into the Federation of the Americas with its capital in Caracas, Venezuela, in order to take advantage of the rising cost of oil. Now, this seems inspired by our timeline's Union of South American Nations. This was a political union founded by Hugo Chavez, the late anti-American president of Venezuela. The USAN came into being in 2011, just a couple of years before Call of Duty Ghosts was released, and while it appears the USAN was created to oppose the United States, it hasn't been that successful. Despite at one time counting every nation in South America as a member, today it only has five members and Venezuela threatened to invade one in 2023, so it's doubtful the USAN is going to invade America anytime soon. Anywho, by 2017, the Federation has become the economic and military equal of the United States, somehow. Their leaders are extremely anti-American, probably because, one, America assassinated a top general of theirs, and two, the United States keeps a loaded gun in orbit pointed at them. You see, in the Ghost timeline, America has an orbital weapons platform called ODIN, which is based on a proposed space-based weapon system by the U.S. Air Force called Project Thor, which likely inspired the name ODIN. According to Blake Stilwell in his 2020 article for We Are Mighty, basically the idea is to put a satellite in space that would shoot tungsten rods at high speeds at ground-based targets. Upside, the potential force of a nuclear bomb without the radiation. Downside, extremely expensive and hard to hit anything with accuracy from that high up. Also, according to Kyle Hill of Because Science's 2019 video on the subject, the power of such a strike might in reality only be a fraction of the power of the Hiroshima bomb. As for whether this is even legal under international law, well, you see, the Outer Space Treaty bans orbital weapons of mass destruction, like nuclear, biological, or chemical weapons. However, since these rods from God are just big bullets, you could argue they don't violate the treaty, but I also don't see how anyone would be pleased by America exploiting this loophole. Anywho, the game begins with the Federation sending up a team to hijack Odin, who then uses it to destroy several cities in the American Southwest before a couple American astronauts destroy the satellite. The Federation then invades Mexico, which hadn't joined the Federation yet, before invading America. The U.S. successfully defends itself, and the Federation is only able to occupy a small strip of the American Southwest. Ten years later, the war is still in a stalemate, with NATO and the rest of the world sitting it out, presumed because they are dependent on Federation oil, or don't want to become a target if the nukes ever start flying. You, the player, mostly play as Logan, an American who fights against the Federation alongside his brother Hesh and their dog Riley. And you are all very good soldiers. Seriously, there was one mission where it seemed those three wiped out an entire Federation division by themselves. Although I do find it funny that because Logan is your standard mute video game protagonist, he stays silent as others volunteer him for increasingly dangerous missions again and again and again. Anywho, things heat up when you discover a Federation plot to end the stalemate that brings you into the world of the ghosts. They are an elite but secret unit of American soldiers that you join in order to take down a former ghost turned traitor named Work. He oversees the Federation's war-winning weapon, which is their version of Odin which they call Loki. I get it! Shut it, Nappa! Thus, the U.S. raids the Loki Command Center, successfully taking control of the weapon and using it against Federation forces. The game ends on a cliffhanger, which I won't spoil, but the response to Ghost was mixed to say the least, and no sequel is forthcoming. But with all that said, is the Federation and its invasion of the U.S. plausible? 
Well, the Federation has one advantage over other fictional invaders of the United States. It's a lot closer. This means it doesn't need to transport troops and supplies across the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean. Sure, the region known as the Darien Gap, which connects North to South America, can in our timeline only really be traveled by foot, but it's possible the Federation built a road through it or else has fleet of ferries in order to move troops and supplies from the core territories of the Federation to the front lines. Either way, the Federation has less logistical nightmares that make so many other American invasion scenarios implausible. But favorable geography can only get you so far. The Federation of the Americas formed itself and expanded its military in an unbelievably short amount of time. Now, to be fair, as the infographic show pointed out in their 2022 video, What If South America Was One Country, the continent does have the potential to become a major world power if the individual states can get over their differences and unite. But those differences are pretty serious once you stop to think about it. Per the 2021 article, Reimagining Regional Governance in Latin America by Federico Merke, Oliver Stunkel, and Andreas E. Feldman for the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, South America's long history of disunity can be attributed to poor economies, social instability, ideological differences between rival nations, and the weakness of democratic institutions due to the election of authoritarians and nationalists. So yeah, if the Federation did somehow form, they would need decades to iron out all these issues, not just a couple years. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I miss the more plausible world building and home front. But what bothers me most about the Federation and ghosts in general is not how implausible it all is, but the message it may be conveying. You see, while doing research for this video, I read an article that Emmanuel Malberg wrote about ghosts for Killscreen. In it, Malberg points out that the game never gives us a definitive answer as to why the Federation attacked the United States. Like, maybe America deserved to be invaded. They are the ones, after all, operating Odin, and perhaps were even responsible for that war in the Middle East. Even the ghosts come off as kinda creepy with their skull mask, their burial rituals for fallen members, and evidence they trained their children at a young age to follow in their footsteps. Indeed, everything we know about the Federation comes from Americans who are going to be biased toward an enemy they've been locked in a decade-long war with. Thus, maybe the subversive message of Ghosts is that it's making you play as the bad guys. Now, to be fair, Malberg makes some good points, and I think it would be interesting to put the player in that kind of situation, but I don't think that was the intention of the game's creators. When you play the game or read through the Call of Duty wiki and other sources, it's clear the Federation is the bad guy of the game. Their government is described as being a military dictatorship, or even fascist. I mean, just look at the symbols they use. We see the Federation in the opening moments of the game cause the deaths of millions of civilians. We also know because of Rourke they use torture and brainwashing to convert foreign soldiers to their cause. And when critiquing creative works, you need to look at the time period they're made in. So for Call of Duty Ghosts, you have to consider a lot of the rhetoric coming out of the United States about migration from Latin America. For example, Many on the right call it an invasion or even genocide. And then you have this game where American cities are being obliterated as a prelude to an actual invasion from Hispanic nation. And then you play as the American hero, slaughtering thousands of them to save their country. I mean, the US's main defense at the start of the game is a giant wall on the southern border. Like the Trump campaign was talking about a wall as early as 2014. There were likely millions of American gamers who were already primed to look at this and think, yeah, that's a good idea. So I don't think Call of Duty Ghosts was meant to be a sneaky, subversive satire. And while I don't want to accuse the game's creators of anything specific, nevertheless, the timeline they ended up creating is pretty distasteful. But we can salvage this. There is an alternate history that can be told that not only gives the Federation of the Americas a reasonable amount of time to unite and grow into a superpower, but also makes Ghosts the subversive video game that Malberg suggested it was. And before I outline my more plausible version of the Federation, we need to ask ourselves a question. Why didn't Latin America unite as one country like those rebel British colonies did? Well, I found John Charles Chastain's 2007 book, Americanos, Latin America's Struggle for Independence, to be pretty useful when answering this question. In his coverage on the wars for independence in both Spanish and Portuguese America, he points out several factors for why I think there wasn't a United States of South America. First, geography was a major problem. The fact of the matter is, the distance between Maine and Georgia is a lot shorter than the distance between Mexico and Argentina. Plus, the East Coast of North America was a lot easier to travel across than early 19th century Latin America, where things like rainforests and mountain ranges made it difficult to travel and communicate, especially in the early 19th century. So, it was much harder for revolutionaries to coordinate in any way except at the local level. 
Second, the colonies of Latin America were much more ethnically and racially diverse. Sure, there were large populations of black slaves in the British colonies, but whites there were in the majority, and English was the predominant language they spoke, while indigenous people were already being pushed west. In Latin America, however, while people of European descent held the political power, they were few in numbers compared to the large populations of indigenous people, slave and free Africans, and mixed people. Although this also meant that revolutionaries in Latin America were more likely to oppose slavery and wanted to make free blacks and indigenous people full citizens in order to rally followers to their cause. Meanwhile, not only were Spanish and Portuguese spoken in their respective colonies, but you also had numerous indigenous languages. And so when you factor in all these differences in addition to geographic isolation, then you have many counties who are easily able to develop their own unique national identity. And third, unfortunately many revolutionaries in Latin America had poor opinions on democracy. Britain had democratic traditions that were exported to their colonies, which the young United States found useful in creating their own federal republic. But Spain and Portugal didn't have such democratic traditions, and were heavily influenced by the Roman Catholic Church, which at the time opposed ideas like freedom and liberty popular during Europe's Age of Enlightenment. Now, to be fair, revolutionaries in Latin America were still inspired by these same ideas, but those of European descent tend to be of the upper class, and were more concerned about popular sovereignty and free trade than democracy and equality, which could threaten their positions in society. To them, democracy meant mob rule rule, an assumption not held by early radical revolutionaries like Miguel Hidalgo y Costillo in Mexico who rallied scores of non-white and mixed people to overthrow the white-led system. Thus, when independence was won, it was not unusual for the new governments to be authoritarian. Heck, Augustin de Etrebide briefly became Mexico's emperor after helping them gain independence. And maybe I'm just a dirty lib, but I think a federation of functioning democracies is a better recipe for success than conservative dictatorships aligned with the Catholic Church. Now, that all said, that doesn't mean there weren't people advocating for a Latin American federation. For example, there was Mariano Moreno, a lawyer and journalist who helped create Argentina's first national government, and Jose Faustino Sanchez Carrion, a Peruvian revolutionary who helped create their republic. Both won a confederation of the former colonies in Spanish America, but unfortunately for our purposes, they died untimely deaths. But there's also the famous revolutionary Simon Bolivar, aka the Liberator of America. The man responsible for the independence of a half a dozen nations wanted to unite not just South America, but all of the Americas. In 1826, he invited all the newly independent nations of the Americas, including the United States, to the Congress of Panama. There, he proposed creating Confederation of American Republics with a parliament and a common military. However, many nations, including the U.S., didn't attend, and those that did weren't impressed by Bolivar's plan. It probably didn't help that Bolivar was one of those revolutionaries with doubts about democracy. In his own country of Gran Colombia, our timelines, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, and Panama, he wanted a powerful presidency with a hereditary senate, which likely turned off the radicals. In the end, only Gran Colombia signed the Treaty of Union, League, and Perpetual Confederation that came out of the Congress. Eventually, even Gran Colombia fell apart into different nations, as local identities trumped any dreams of regional cooperation or federation to the point that, even in the present day, Latin America struggles to find common ground. But, what if that wasn't the case? What if Latin America united into a single federation? Let's assume the Congress of Panama is full of more pro-unity people, who are able to rein in Bolivar's authoritarian cynicism and convince people back home that unity is a good idea. Thus, Gran Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia all sign on to the Treaty of Union, while other nations voice approval of the concept even if they aren't ready to bind their homes to it just yet. The new state calls itself the Federation of the Americas, with its capital in Lima, Peru. Now, in its earliest years, the Federation is more of a confederation, as the member states maintain significant levels of autonomy. Nevertheless, the Federation government sees some early successes as they negotiate favorable trade deals with European states, like Britain, while also ensuring there are no trade barriers between member states. To facilitate this, the Federation adopts a common currency and acts as a mediator during disputes. Support grows for the Federation, especially among black and indigenous people due to their support for abolition and full citizenship for everyone living in the Federation, regardless of race. 
As the Federation gains more authority from the member states, they're able to enact far-reaching plans, such as a well-funded public education system and infrastructure projects to build more roads and later railroads to tie the Federation closer together. By the end of the 19th century, the Federation was a major world power. Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, and Paraguay all eventually signed on to the Treaty of Union. Brazil joined after slavery was abolished and the emperor was overthrown in 1889, thus unifying most of South America. Unfortunately, this triumph came at a time when relations with their northern neighbor were becoming tense. You see, while invited to the Congress of Panama, the delegation from the United States arrived after it ended, and their reaction to the new federation was rather negative, especially due to its abolitionist tendencies. Meanwhile, events like the Mexican-American War, the Spanish-American War, the construction of the Nicaraguan Canal, and American intervention in Central America and the Caribbean all enforced the view in the Federation that the U.S. was treating these North American nations, all of whom were potential future members of the Federation, as part of their sphere of influence. Events elsewhere, however, put the inevitable clash between the two powers on the back burner. Germany's strategy of unrestricted submarine warfare brought the Federation into World War I, around the same time as the United States. And while it's debatable if the Federation Expeditionary Force had any impact on the outcome of the war, the Federation leaders and generals were quick to realize that their relatively peaceful history made them woefully unprepared for the challenges of modern warfare. Thus, the Federation spent the interwar years increasing the size of its military. During the Spanish Civil War, the Federation sent weapons to the Spanish Republicans and volunteers from the Federation went to fight the fascists, which provided much needed experience for the Federation military when World War II began. Although neutral at first, once again German attacks against Federation shipping drew them into the war on the same side as their rival, the United States. Federation troops, sailors, and airmen fought in both major theaters of the war, while the Federation factories supplied materials to the Allied war effort, and their participation earned the Federation a permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council. As the Cold War simmered, relations between the Federation and the United States began to deteriorate once again. Because of the Federation's opposition to communism, they were initially nominally allied with the U.S., with the Federation even contributing troops to the U.N.'s defense of South Korea during the Korean War. However, American policy in Central America, including the U.S. discrediting pro-Federation politicians, drives a wedge between the two powers. The Federation built their own nuclear weapons in the 1970s, while also pursuing a policy of detente with the Soviets and building stronger ties with the nine aligned nations. Thus, when the Soviet Union fell in 1991, it didn't necessarily end a Cold War, but instead it took on a new form as the rivalry between the United States and the Federation became more hostile. The Federation soon came to symbolize an alternative to U.S. hegemony, especially as international opposition to the War on Terror grew. By 2017, the Federation is one of the largest economies in the world, with a population larger than the United States. Politically, it leans left, with Democratic Socialist parties doing well in their parliament. It generally has good relations with the most of the world, even when Argentina half-jokingly demands the UK return the Falklands to them. The Federation boasts a diverse economy, with agriculture, manufacturing, and technology all being important sectors. The Federation is also a leader in green tech, thanks to being home to large deposits of lithium, which is used in electric car batteries. Meanwhile, many member states are major sources for solar, wind, or geothermal energy. Unfortunately, the Federation still struggles with preventing deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. The Federation is tied together by highways, seaports, and airports, which not only connect the member states to each other, but also the rest of the world. Meanwhile, hybrid airships move cargo to some of the Federation's more remote regions. Spanish and Portuguese are the official languages, but indigenous languages and languages spoken by large immigrant groups are given special status. This, along with a strong economy, has attracted immigration from many parts of the world, including talent from the United States who seek out the Federation's economic opportunities and relative freedom because things aren't going so well in the good old US of A. The War on Terror and their rivalry with the more leftist Federation has reignited America's worst right-wing Cold War tendencies. The authoritarian nationalist wing of the Republican Party has dominated politics for years now and spews anti-Federation propaganda by declaring them the next Soviet Union. Meanwhile, public support for organizations like the United Nations and NATO has withered in the U.S. The U.S. has also continued to provoke the Federation by a recent bombing campaign in Mexico against suspected drug cartels but which may just be pro-Federation rebels, while also boosting the number of troops in the Nicaraguan Canal Zone. There is absolutely a giant concrete wall on the southern border in this timeline. Ultimately, all this comes to a head when I blatantly steal a plot point from Chris Hadfield's 2021 Sidewise Award-nominated novel, The Apollo Murders. 
And by that, I mean Federation intelligence discovers that a recent U.S. research satellite is actually a kinetic bombardment weapons platform. Federation leadership sees this as a deliberate attempt by the U.S. to threaten them to demand some kind of response. So the plan is that in the next Federation Space Agency launch, the Federation capsule would fly near the satellite and attempt to sabotage it. However, things go awry when the Federation learn that the weapons platform is manned. In the ensuing confrontation, both sides lose astronauts during the destruction of the station. World War III immediately begins to trend on Twitter, and this one time the posters might be right as the two world powers race to war. Accusations and threats are directed at each other while both militaries are put on high alert. Things finally boil over when the U.S. president orders airstrikes against Federation military bases in retaliation for their dead astronauts. The Federation retaliates in kind, and thus the war begins. Mexico and Central America quickly become a battleground, but to the shock of the United States, the Federation is able to drive the U.S. out of the region, thanks in part to the infrastructure they built up in the Darien Gap. And soon, Federation armies have reached America's southern border. The war thus enters a period of stalemate as the Federation is hesitant to invade America directly, out of fear that what has been a conventional war could soon turn nuclear. Meanwhile, the United States has suffered major losses and don't think they have the resources or manpower to push the Federation back, especially as public opinion against the war grows. This is a state of things as you, the player, are sent on various missions behind enemy lines to harass the Federation. Your success brings you to the attention of the Ghosts, a secretive and zealous American Special Forces team who wants you to join them in order to help end the stalemate. However, as you go on more missions with the Ghosts, where you witness their brutal methods and even interact with actual people from the Federation, you begin to question whether you're fighting on the right side in this war. And that is my version of Call of Duty Ghosts. Uh, sure, I didn't change history too much because I didn't want to make it alien to the player, but I think I nevertheless made the Federation not only more plausible, but also more sympathetic. But why bother doing all that? Well, if I can give Call of Duty Ghosts some credit, it's good to highlight a region of the globe that doesn't get a lot of attention, or at least positive attention, by American audiences. Unfortunately, the Federation of the Americas is just bad. You can tell very little effort was put into making it, especially when you consider that the game's only real named antagonist isn't a citizen of the Federation, but instead a brainwashed American who seems more interested in petty personal revenge than anything else. Call of Duty Ghosts could have been a subversive satire about the United States' relation to the rest of the Americas, but instead it's just another first-person shooter with a generic evil empire of brown people. It's incredibly disappointing, and I hope if any lesson can be learned from it, it's that video game creators should learn more about the people they are going to turn into glorified Goombas. Well, that's up to say in the subject. If you enjoy what I do, please like, comment, subscribe, click that bell icon, share this video, or support me on Patreon. I'm Matt Mitrich, the alternate historian. Bye.